Excellent. Um, very good. Thank you so much Beth, for this uh, lovely introduction and for inviting me, you, and Mac. You've done so much organizing this. And thank you, Carlos, for helping us with the uh, setup here. These hybrid setups are, are complicated, uh, uh, but it sounds like we're in good shape. And thanks to the department for inviting me. And it's exciting to me that this is an, an experiment in uh, cross uh, language and cross uh, uh, period uh, uh, lectures, because that's very much what I've come to do. Uh, you mentioned the uh, anthology and, the, and that work on the anthology in, in many ways will inform what I'm gonna talk about today. I started out as a specialist in most European uh, uh, literature in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, until I kind of stumbled into this job uh, to edit the world literature anthology. And, um, and that for me was a real conversion experience uh, for, for mostly two reasons. I thought that I had been sort of relatively widely read before and I very quickly realized how much I didn't know and really started a crash course in reading for many years in reading world literature. So that, and that I just discovered a lot of great texts that I had never really even heard in some cases, even heard about before, hasn't certainly never read. And I'm gonna briefly mention some of them today. The second one uh, has to do with scale, which uh, Beth also <coughs> mentioned, uh, because the first thing I did when charged with, you know, overseeing this work on 4,000 years of literature was to read world history because I felt like I needed this as a kind of background for thinking about literature on that scale. And then I started to look for works that would talk about literature, the broad outlines of, of literature, world literature on that same scale. And I realized that there was almost no, there was almost nothing uh, about literature that treated literature as sort of one integrated history the way uh, historians talked about world literature. And so this meant that together with all these collaborators, because a very collaborative project, we sort of had to slowly piece together that larger story of literature. <clears throat> and that for me was really eye-opening because I realized that even though I've been at this point studying and teaching and writing about literature for you know, a, a, <clears throat> over a decade, that I actually, because of, I had been along with most people so specialized in like one or two centuries, a couple of languages, that I actually didn't know some of the most fundamental aspects of literature, including, so this is not advancing. <laughs> very good. It, I, it, it looks very complicated. Uh, um, in any case, uh, fundamental questions such as when was writing invented how perfect um, how often was writing invented what are the broad what is the broad shape uh, of of literature what are the main genres of literature these really fundamental questions i i realized i actually had no answer to those questions so slowly and as i mentioned with the help of others i tried to piece together that broader story of literature. And so this became for me a sort of exercise in rescaling literature. As, as you know, almost if you look at, you know, the MLA or other um, prominent journals or the main book publications in our fields, you'll see that almost all writing about literature defaults to a time span of about, I would say, sort of 50 to 100 years. Uh, almost all writing, uh, I think, about literature is done in that time span. Uh, I'd say about 95%. Uh, there is a sort of mini trend in sort of micro histories, sort of the one year book, like 1599, one year in the life of Shakespeare, or, or you know, 1922, the great year of modernism um, on that scale. But at the other end of the scale, talking about 200 or even 2000 or 4000 years, there, there's very little. So I try to start doing that and to see what emerges. And it's kind of a crazy undertaking and there are lots of reasons why people don't do it, having to do with expertise and so on and so forth. Um, but I think I also realized that once you zoom out and of course you then rely on incredible amount of expert specialized studies that you then try to synthesize as historians of world literature, 
do, something interesting happens. Then we suddenly, you, what comes into view are some of these trends and questions that otherwise surface relatively little. So I want to give you just a little bit of a taste of that kind of large scale thinking about literature before then applying that to the question of climate change as I did in that little booklet. So all stories need to start at the beginning, I guess. No, not all do, but mine does. So what is that broad, broad story of literature? It begins with a thank you very much, Carlos. Um, it begins with um, the big bang of literature in Mesopotamia about 5,000 years ago. Um, that big bang is very difficult to reconstruct what led uh, to the first full writing system and the Mesopotamian uniforms. Um, it's hard to reconstruct, but fortunately there's a story in Mesopotamian scribes told about the invention of writing. And the story goes like this, it's set in the city of Uruk, which is one of the first cities in human history. Um, and comprising about uh, 50,000 people in one urban space made possible by revolution in agriculture. And this will become important later. Um, and it features a king of Uruk, the city state, uh, who is the signs on a neighboring kingdom of Arata. So he sends a messenger to Arata and threatens invasion. We can all uh, know what that means uh, uh, in the last two, uh, last month. Uh, and the king of Arata, though, sends the messenger back to Uruk and saying, you know, go to hell, I will not give in to you. And so this messenger sent, runs back and forth. Uh, there are more and more threats. And, but the king of, of uh, Arata won't give it. And so at some point, the king of Uruk, this expansionist city state, gets so angry that he lets out a long rant against the king of Arata. And the messenger standing next to him panics because he can't remember that long rant. And so it's at this moment in the story about the invention of writing that the king of Uruk takes a, a handful of clay, um, puts his words onto the clay, gives that clay message to the messenger. The messenger runs one more time to the king of Arata, say, he is, you know, here's my, this is the final threat. And the king of Arata says, takes that piece of clay, holds it to his ear, there's no message coming. And then in, you know, in the sight of his whole court, he's so impressed by this technology that the king of Uruk can, can put his, work, his words onto clay that he finally gives it to become a vassal to a world. Okay, so th there are two things that are interesting about the story. The, the A, um, it's, uh, it's very self-serving. So it's a story told by Mesopotamian scribes who are clearly very proud of, their, of this new technology and who say basically in the story, this small handheld device is more powerful than threats of invasion and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, so it's, a, it's a power, about the power of technology uh, and about projecting power, diplomatic military power over space. And that's historically accurate. There, there are fragments of cuneiform that were for, found all over the Near East. So it's very clear that these Mesopotamian city-states use writing to, to control a territory, leading to a first territorial empire. And the second, it, that for all, all purposes, what's interesting about the story is that it has actually at this point nothing to do with literature. And, and that is also true about these first uses of writing, that they were used to, to keep records. To, they led to a kind of imperial bureaucracy, recording economic transactions, sending diplomatic messages as in this story, but not stories. Stories, storytelling was done orally as it had before. But at some point, these Mesopotamian accountants is really what they were. One of these accountants started to write down stories, and that's really the big bang of literature. And so in this book, The Written World, I try to then describe the, the pattern that starts with that big bang. First, the intersection of different oral storytelling traditions with different forms of writing, as it happened in Mesopotamia, taking you know, and that same thing happens in, in different early writing cultures in China, in, in 
in Egypt and in, in, in other places as sort of the first stage in a way of, of literature. I started to get different, interested in different writing formats. So the clay tablet with which we began was the first format. Then the scroll becomes the next. This is an early version of the Hebrew Bible. Um, that's important. What really stood out to me in this sort of big picture view of literature was not just the importance of formats, but also more generally of writing technologies. So including the most two most important ones, namely paper and print, both Chinese inventions. This is the earliest surviving printed scroll in the world, as you can see from 868, so many hundreds of years before Gutenberg. And two things are interesting about it. The first is it's printed on paper. Um, really important paper for lowering the cost of literature, leading really to an explosion of literacy uh, in, in China. And then all the more so, then it gets combined with woodblock print. This is uh, a copy of the Diamond Sutra, a Buddhist sutra, and Buddhists in China, really the first, one of the first proselytizing religions were the early adopters of this double uh, um, revolution in writing technologies, namely paper and print. If we follow those two inventions, it's interesting because they separate. The knowledge of paper next moves to the Arabic world. Um, Baghdad becomes the center of paper making, fueling the golden age of Arabic letters. But the Arabic world does not adopt print. Uh, there, it's purely a paper-based explosion of literacy. And then finally, paper goes, gets into Europe via Al-Andalus, the Arabic occupied part of, uh, of Spain. Print somehow arrives in Europe via the Silk Route, and it's unclear how that works. And then with Gutenberg, you have really a reinvention of print and more importantly, a reconversion of paper and print as it had been in China. So separate routes, they reconnect, and that leads to the second print uh, revolution. So this is sort of the story of writing technologies that, that, that I try to sketch one of the patterns uh, um, of, of this big picture view of, uh, uh, of literature. The other question I mentioned was, how often was writing invented? I had no idea. I would have had no uh, answer to this question. And it's a difficult question because we know it started in Mesopotamia. There are other early writing cultures, China, Egypt, but they are all part of the Eurasian landmass. So it's actually almost imp it is impossible to prove that, there were, that they weren't in indirect contact. The writing systems themselves are very different, but the idea of writing could have been accomplished by idea transfer. So in some sense, one could say perhaps all writing is back to that one Mesopotamian accountant, that's sort of a <laughs> hypothetical case, or the king of Uruk, who the angry king of Uruk puts his words into clay, if not for the minds. Because that's the fascinating thing that we know humans invented writing at least twice because of the minds, because the minds invented writing without any contact to Eurasia. So we have really, we have a kind of amazing, almost like a control experiment. What happens to a literary tradition? What are the different stages of literature? And it's very interesting to, to compare Mayan writing uh, to, to the big Eurasian literary traditions and see what kind of practices around books and technologies the minds develop their own form of paper, their own format, an accordion style book, uh, and, and sacred texts. And all in, in a sense, it's a very, I mean, there are interesting differences, but the broad outlines are actually quite similar, which is interesting. It really shows that, in some sense, what happened on the Eurasian continents was not a fluke, but had a kind of almost historical necessity once writing gets invented. Um, as I was trying to sketch the story, um, I realized that I was really telling a techno a talk story about technology, and I became worried that I was falling into a kind of techno determinism. 
which is why I started to get very interested in the relation between uh, writing technologies and morality. And that became also an important uh, through line for me and led me, for example, to study and include the Epic of Sanjata, one of these texts of world literature, really crucial texts that I had not even known about before working on the anthology of world literature, uh, in a, a West African epic uh, that talks about a medieval, late medieval kingdom. The stories were transmitted orally um, alongside different writing cultures. Uh, at some point, Mali was uh, uh, became Islam, Islamic, and there was Islamic as based literacy, but it didn't affect these older stories of Sanjata. Then, in the 19th century, uh, it, it became a French colony. There's of course French writing and Latin alphabet, but it didn't really affect this oral material it was only in the 20th century that that intersection of storytelling, oral storytelling and writing happened. And this text, which I think is the best, best text version, happened through a collaboration of a Mali singer, uh, Tase Conde, and an American scholar, David Conrad, whom I know. And that version, that intersection happened in 1994. So it's very interesting to see that that intersection, that dynamic relationship between orality and writing doesn't just happen at the beginning. It doesn't just happen with the epic of uh, Gilgamesh or the Homeric epic. It, it keeps happening uh, even today. Um, and I know that there's someone here who works on Amazonian myths and uh, uh, and so that that's here. Um, um, it's, it's such a crucial and uh, important dynamic. So those are just sort of some snapshots from that larger project uh, um, and, and these different literary traditions, the relation between orality and literature. Uh, and part of that is, for example, also an interest in storytelling uh, uh, collections that I had not thought about much beyond a thousand and one nights, but it became very clearly very quickly clear to me that it was one of the major genres of world literature. Um, and in terms of the importance of different written texts and their influence on history, that became another through line, the aforementioned communist manifesto. So all of this, I tried to synthesize in this book that Beth mentioned, and that was a sort of an, a, a distillation, if you will, of all these years of working on the anthology with all these scholars and, and sort of synthesizing uh, the specialized work and trying to put it together into this larger narrative. And so what I then did is basically bring this synthetic world literature, big picture approach to climate change. And that brings me really to the, the, the second half. And I want to sketch a little bit what what that means. The project basically has two sides to it. The first one is very much continuous with, with, with what I just described, namely a question of how to read the uh, basically the canon of literature or the history of, uh, of literature with an eye towards climate change. Now, of course, there is this established field by now established of eco-criticism and that there's a very interesting and lively uh, you know, subfield in a sense of literary studies. Looking at that subfield, it's striking that almost all of it uh, is based on 20th century and 21st century literature, sometimes going back to the 19th century, but very little before. Now, there are some good reasons for that, because of course, industrial industrialization, which you know, accelerated climate change incredibly started really with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. And you could say another inflection point is in the, in the 70s, when climate science starts to understand what was then called the greenhouse effect. Um, and then you know, a, a, a literature starts to emerge around that climate side. So it, it, it makes sense that in many ways, the story of literature and climate change is a 19th and 20th and now 21st century story. However, 
by taking that much broader history of literature and, and using that and, and channeling that, uh, applying that, if you will, to this question of climate change, one very quickly realizes that actually this, this canon of world literature and these broad patterns of world literature actually lent themselves really well to answering certain questions about the way in which humans have altered their environment. And so let me give you just return to Mesopotamia for, for one second, uh, uh, in part because it's the origin, and sometimes not always, origins are destiny, uh, or at least set patterns that, that, that are important to understand. So I mentioned the King of Uruk, uh, and that first intersection of storytelling and and um, and and writing uh, the invention of writing technology, the first great text to emerge from that intersection, first great text of all literature, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk, the place in the story about the invention of writing, where the king of Uruk has invented writing, and it's an epic that's very proud of writing. It presents itself as written. Uh, it presents King Gilgamesh as a king who knows how to read and write. And that may not sound like a big deal, but it actually is. You know, some of you may have read, you know, the, 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 the Homeric epics. The Homeric epics take place in an ent entirely in a world without writing, with one weird exception. And so they present themselves as being sung uh, uh, or told orally by you know, part of the uh, Odyssey. It's told by Odysseus himself. Uh, uh, who is carrying favors with this host of the, uh, of the fames. So many of these early epics actually don't even when they're written down, uh, don't mention writing, but the Epic of Gilgamesh, much earlier than the Homeric epics, it's very proud, very knows that it, the culture, Mesopotamian culture has invented writing and that important cultural technology. Um, so um, it's the first text in this literary tradition. And, I just want to spend a moment to read this text with attention to climate change. And it's really, to my mind, astonishing how much it speaks to it in at least two ways. So as you may know, when this text, the Epic of Gilgamesh, disappeared along with cuneiform writing, uh, when cuneiform writing went out of use, it was never transliterated into successor writing systems. So it disappeared. People didn't even know that it existed for 2,000 years until it was rediscovered by chance in the middle of the 19th century. And then laboriously deciphered. Uh, that took another couple of decades at the British Library. The five, a very lowly library employee is an interesting story. Uh, uh, not a fancy professor at Oxford, Cambridge. Uh, but what astonished Victorian England was that the Epic of Gilgamesh, especially the Sabbath, contained a story of the flood that was almost identical to the one that's in the Bible, but clearly much earlier text. So it's, it's, it's astonishing. So it, it's the first version of the story of the flood, this catastrophic uh, uh, event of you know, a, a climate cat catastrophe. It's very interesting to compare, compare the version that's in the Epic of Gilgamesh to the biblical story that's, become, that's been arguably the most important story, even today, thinking about apocalyptic climate change. You know, the Hollywood movie system really relies on, I think, on that biblical story of the end of the world through climate change. Comparing the two, what's striking is that the details are strikingly similar, so it's very clear that they go to use the same source or that one led to the other. Um, but the framing of it is different. In the, in the Bible, the flood is very clearly brought, brought on as punishment. Humans have sinned, and so they're being punished for their sins by, uh, through the flood by God. In the, in, the, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's a little bit similar. It, it's a little bit different. It's sort of similar. It's also different in that the gods decide on the flood, but it's not primarily punishment for sin. It's more like population control. Humans have become too numerous. 
there's no sense of that they're kind of rebel against the gods or anything or, or of sin. They become too humor, too, too uh, uh, humorous, too numerous. <laughs> and so we need to call the herd a little bit. And so they bring that that's how the flood is framed. And that's very interesting because it's not so much a moral <laughs> register, but more a kind of, you know, ecological balance, uh, so to speak, uh, register. And that, I think that has interesting uh, implications for what kind of story types we use today to think about or talk about climate change. Okay, so that's one thing, the, the flood and, and as a paradigm for climate change as a paradigm that we default to. Uh, and I think these two versions offer sort of different paths, the moralizing sin path, path that, that's still very powerful. And it may actually be an important, an important way for perhaps today to talk about climate change, but maybe it also turns a lot of people off. So maybe the Gilgamesh version is uh, uh, interesting and interesting alternative. But the story of the flood is actually not the main reason why I think the Epic of Gilgamesh is such an interesting text when it comes to climate change, because unlike in the Hebrew Bible, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the story of the flood is actually just an interpolated tale. It doesn't really play an important role in the overall story of the Epic. I wanna take a moment to look at that overall story. So just to remind you, it's, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh is, a, is an epic about King Gilgamesh, King of Uruk, place of the invention of writing, presumably. Um, and he's sort of an out of control king. He, he, he fights with men, he rapes women before their marriage. He is totally out of control. So the gods decide that they, they need to rein in, they need to rein in this out of control king. So they create a creature called Enkidu, um, for that purpose. The, the creature and Kidu is a forest creature, lives in the forest, runs with the animals, eats raw food, drinks along with the other animals and the watering hole. So this creature and Kidu doesn't yet, you know, have anything to do with King Gilgamesh, but there, it comes an irritation because this creature and Kidu helps animals, for example, escape traps, so trappers and hunters get angry that there is this useless uh, Enkidu, this creature who helps the animals in the forest. Or not, not the forest, the animals. So they send a woman from the city to Enkidu to seduce Enkidu. And after the seduction, the animals reject Enkidu. And so he has, in some sense, no other choice but to come into the city, enclosed by the city walls, King Gilgamesh is famous for having rebuilt the city walls and, and, uh, and encapsulating the city. And so Enkidu now become, has to become human. He has to start uh, rejecting raw food and eating cooked and processed foods, and especially uh, uh, the bread. He has to, instead of drinking water, he has to drink beer made out of barley. He has to shave and cut his hair. Um, and become human. So it's a program of turning this wildling into a human. Okay, when this is accomplished, Enkidu and Gilgamesh become, you know, become great friends and they go out on adventures. The most important adventure is when they slay the monster of Humbaba. It was a great, very classic epic scene when you, know, when you slay the monster and they go out and they slay the monster and they come back. So this is the kind of epic, uh, the rest of the epic uh, is like that. And at some point in Kidu dies and uh, uh, Gilgamesh really mourns him and then looks for eternal life. And that's when he hears the story of the flood. And that's sort of the end of the story. By the end of the story, and, uh, uh, King Gilgamesh is sort of reformed. He's no longer out of control. He's become a good king. Now, why is this relevant for climate change? Uh, the monster, Umbaba, is a guardian of the forest. So they go out and they go very far to find that wild forest and to kill the forest monster. But okay, so they kill the forest monster, but why? It's not just because it's a trope of epic literature. No, we learn, and the epic is very explicit about it. They, they are actually on a logging expedition. 
Why? Because the cities of Mesopotamia need wood, timber for roofs, for building these cities. And because there are more and more cities, Mesopotamia has actually already been deforested. So they have to go all the way to Lebanon to fell the cedars of Lebanon. And they're very precise about how, many, how much wood they bring back. So this is really a resource extraction. And it's a poignant uh, uh, um, irony that this wildling who, you know, who had to be brought into city living, into, who had not been defined as non-human as long as he lived in the wilderness and who had to be literally seduced into city living, now becomes with the fervor of the convert the defender of city living, he's the one who eggs on Gilgamesh to kill the forest monster and to bring back all this timber uh, for, for, um, for building up work. So you see that at the very beginning, at the very open, you know, origin of world literature is a story that camouflages resource extraction with a fight, a kind of exciting fight against the monster that shows essentially that if you live in the wilderness, you are, you are not human, that you have to be seduced into city living and processed foods and, 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 and al consumption of alcoholic beverages and so on and so forth. And that only then do you become human. So it, it's a text that draws a very sharp line, or one could say a, a city wall between human city living and the wilderness. And then justifies or shows really that at the cost of resource extraction leading to your deforestation. So it's fascinating that that, in a sense, that pattern of literature taking the side of urban life, um, and in some sense, you could say being complicit with resource extraction, but also showing it, if we just read it with that in mind, uh, uh, is a great document. And that's the kind of reading of world literature that, that I propose. And it's true that it works particularly well with the epic of Gilgamesh. But I started to run the entire canon of world literature essentially through this lens. And it's amazing. It works essentially with, with every text. You have to pay attention to how human, you know, the notion of human is being defined, how agriculture uh, uh, is uh, 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 often in the margins of texts is dealt with what kind of resource extraction sustains human habitation at these different moments. And, and uh, uh, you will find something like this in, I, I'd say, almost every text, sometimes more explicit, sometimes less explicit, sometimes in the center of the story, as in the epic of Gilgamesh, sometimes in the margin of the story. So I tried to develop a kind of almost like a protocol of reading literature and not just the small canon of environmental literature, which is great and which I love, but really any literary text. So that's the, if you will, first part. And I, you know, I do the same, you know, with the Popol Vuh uh, uh, is really fascinating because the whole civilization of the Popol Vuh depends on maize, uh, 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 corn cultivation, and that plays an important, though somewhat more uh, you know, a role that has to be teased out of this text. You can look at the epic of Sunjata and the way agriculture is represented and cultivation of land and how it intersects with city living and creation of this empire. And you can really uh, uh, take a lot of different kind of texts uh, uh, like that. So that's the first part, how to read the canon of literature basically as a resource as a archive of the way in which humans have relate, re related to the environment. And I think you realize that it's not just, a, that environmental change is not just a story about the oil economy or industrialization, it is, or, 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 or plastics, all important, but that somehow the, the stories that have been floating around in our cultures and in our minds go much further back. Uh, uh, and so in a sense, we're not just up against things that have been established for 200 years, but something much more fundamental and, and profound. And I think a way of grappling with that uh, uh, is necessary and, and can be perhaps done through this protocol. And so to uh, uh, 
come to the second part, then I sort of shift gears. So the first part is, if you will, the critical part, reading world literature with an eye towards climate change, a kind of critical register, if you will, uh, that you could broadly describe as literature's complicity uh, with, with that sort of mindset. Uh, and you know there there may be occasionally interesting alternatives where literature doesn't uh, are, is not complicit and offers maybe alternatives. Sort of current climate writing, of course, is very interested in that. But in my experience, complicity and justification for some form of resource extraction is by far the the, the rule rather than the, the the exception in from from the very beginning. But that's sort of the, the, the critical project, if you will. Um, what follows from that is essentially, well, if all the stories we've been telling about human relation to the environment are wrong, and that's just a simplified way of putting it, what stories should we tell? And so this puts actually you know, people like us who study and teach literature in a very interesting position because it means that actually anyone interested in climate change needs some sense to come to us and ask us about the different kinds of stories they should be telling. And I think people are really waking up to that. You know, for about 40 years, I think the idea was that better climate science, more accurate models will sway people to stop, to change their behavior. And I think it's become overwhelmingly clear uh, 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 that, that, that that doesn't work. And this critical project, because these stories are so old uh, um, and so progressive, is partially an explanation why. So I think climate scientists and policymakers and everyone interested in that, especially also it's such a generational story that this work you were saying, uh, are waking up to the fact that we need to come up with different stories about human relationships to the environment. So, and I think that actually as literary scholars, we should be in a, in a good position to at least give policymakers and people in think tanks and, and, and the UN and everyone else involved with scientists uh, uh, some point. So I want to just sketch, and this, these are very preliminary thoughts uh, about this. So what do, in a sense, I think one way of putting it, what, what practical things do we, we literary scholars know about storytelling that can actually be helpful. And this is a pretty flagrant call for instrumentalizing what we know about literature. Um, and so the first um, aspect uh, of story, things we know about storytelling is plot structures. You know, what, so I just mentioned apocalyptic tales like the story of the flood, that's one story type we default to, but maybe there are others. And this is how Kurt Vonnegut talks about different story types. Let's see what There's no reason saying. why the simple shapes of story can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. <coughs> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the BE axis. B stands for beginning. E stands for electricity. <laughs> now, this is an exercise in relativity, really. It's the shape of the curves of what matters and not their origins. So, we'll start a little above average, is why do I get a depressing person? <laughs> the whole thing we call this story man in a hole, but it needs to be about a man and it needs to be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. <laughs> All right, not copyrighted. Another story, also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer. Boy gets girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. 
find something wonderful. Just love it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Got it back again. <laughs> People like that. Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. Is computers cannot play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Ha! Surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing, you know, people don't like stories below about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile tempered ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. <laughs> You've heard it. Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum whack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. Is she, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. <laughs> Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her mascara. <laughs> gives her means of transportation. Goes to the party. Dances with the prince has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now, there's a slight inclination to that line that I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. But she wind up at the same level. Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe fix. <coughs> she Achieved off-scale happiness. <laughs> okay, so uh, the Kurt Vonnegut's timing is so perfect. It's so great. Um, anyway, so th those are his three stories, but of course there are so many ways of dividing up the narrative universe into story types, not just those three. Um, especially when we look at the telling storytelling about climate change, we have, for example, stories of rebirth. We have stories of overcoming monsters, as in the epic of Gilgamesh. We have genie out of the bottle, can <coughs> put it back again, another story type, uh, of course, from the Thousand and One Nights, that very often used with climate change. Uh, conflict with God, again, the biblical story of the flood, and to much lesser extent, the, the, the story of Gilgamesh and the story uh, with it, uh, uh, of the fight against the flood and the apocalypse, by far the most common story type about climate change. So here, my point is, let's not always, and people have, I think, woken up to that, always default to these couple of story types and think about a much larger range of narrative options uh, when it comes to telling the story of climate change. So these are story types, but there's another way of looking at stories, and that has to do with agency that I think is at least as important as this description of story types, in part because it's, it's, it's clearly about changing our collective behavior. Now, what, how does this, you know, the history of literature look like from the perspective of agency? Well, there is sort of the, the paradigm of Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces, the attempt to basically reduce all story types into a single one, namely into the hero's journey. And as some of you may know, this becomes the Bible for Hollywood, and it's all about the individual hero and his, and it's a very male paradigm, uh, and his journey. So this is clearly, I think, inadequate for story. Uh, for climate change, because we, we don't need one 
one hero to save us. But again, a lot of stories about certainly movies about climate change sort of hinge on that one person, three people who are going to save us. So I started to think again about an old favorite of mine, the Communist Manifesto, not because I think a communist revolution will save us, although, you know, there have been, of course, very, very, it's been very interesting work about uh, growth and, and, and capitalism and, and, and climate change. But because the Communist Manifesto, to my mind, is the most successful text in world literature to propose a collective protagonist. It's a, it's a text that basically invented a collective protagonist named the proletariat. This is what Marx and Engels do in this text. And Communist Manifesto <laughs> is a story about basically telling the story of humankind. It's a big picture kind of storytelling enterprise. First sentence is the history of uh, human society, it's the history of class struggle. And then basically the Communist Manifesto starts to tell a huge story of, of, of human evolution based on class struggle and different historical protagonists culminating in this new historical protagonist called the proletariat. So I so I don't want to use this as an as a as a as an example because of because I think the proletariat is gonna save us, but because of the way in which this text managed to launch a collective protagonist uh, and do that in the form of the manifesto but combined with storytelling. And I think by the way that that's one reason why the communist manifesto survived uh, and what distinguished it from all these other manifestos that were floating around the revolutionary Europe in the, in the middle of the 19th century. So here then we have a collective agent uh, uh, instead of the individual male, male hero. And the <coughs> other texts uh, in world literature that I started to think about are these, these story collections, these frame, tale, uh, frame tales like the Panchatantra or the Thousand and One Nights and many of these other story collections. Why? Because it's also clear to me that it's not going to be enough just to have one text that somehow envisions a new collective protagonist clearly we need a sort of collective act of storytelling. And this is what's sort of happening around in the most interesting work, I think on climate change and narrative is about collecting oral stories, uh, about understanding indigenous storytelling. Uh, so very much this kind of question of oral storytelling and writing and collective acts of storytelling that I was also interested in this big, bigger picture, uh, uh, history of literature in the written world. And so I think these, frame tale narratives are very interesting because they, and sort of in roughly the Middle Ages, they're the single most influential genre of literature, I think, and from many different, uh, in many different cultures. Um, because they channel collective acts of storytelling and then basically direct them, focus them through the frame tale. And so not that we have to use that exactly the way medieval literature did, but it seems to me another way if I look at world literature for sort of examples of the kind of storytelling that I think we can, we should think about, this would be another moment of inspiration texts that somehow channel uh, or present uh, collective acts of storytelling. So those are the three sort of perspectives, uh, the question of agency, uh, and um, um, the, the plot structures and collections of agency. And so this is what I just sketched very briefly in the end of the book. But again, the idea is that on the one hand, we have a kind of critical history of <clears throat> world literature and a protocol for reading all these texts of literature that we might come across within interest in climate change and human interventions into you know, alteration of their environment. But then also use the disciplinary knowledge that we as literary scholars have in order to very almost, I sometimes fantasize about actually haven't quite done it, but putting together a toolkit, if you will, from the history of literature to give uh, public storytellers of all kinds uh, to encourage them to not always default 
to a particular kinds of story types, to particular kinds of protagonists, the way they tend to be now. And uh, thank you very much. Plenty of time for questions, so ask away. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Kushner, for uh, I think that you're a great storyteller. You have taken us through a huge uh, journey of, uh, you know, pretty much the history of, of uh, our species, uh, you know, to uh, individualisms and collective agencies, you know, and we see this, you know, so. You know the cultural history of the world. You know, we see romanticism. You know, the collective uh, the story uh, telling you know from Marx. <laughs> so I uh, and I, I couldn't help to be thinking from the very beginning of the talk about uh, how some traditional cultures have the counter narrative to that one of Gilgamesh. You know. We got a we got a, we got a monster there, a, a forest guardian, and uh, we are from the city. We are building civilization, but we need to get rid of him because he certainly is, is a black obstacle to our endeavors to, to where we are right now. So so it's pretty. I, I think I was really it's really fascinating how uh, your uh, uh, the storytelling it just uh, connects. With the all the counter narratives that are emerging uh, lately uh, during the 20th century, towards the end of the 20th century, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, you know the narratives of of uh, indigenous cultures, and uh, you know where uh, you know those indigenous cultures have been uh, uh, presented uh, by explorers, colonizers. Uh, throughout the past uh, you know, few hundred years uh, as uh, barbarians, uh, the ones who are an obstacle to uh, uh, the, the building of civilization. That one which we inherited from the older narratives, you know, from the cradle of civilization of Greek and Rome, right? When we got Socrates saying, hey, my friend, I don't think that I get much uh, Intelligence from uh, talking to, you know about the about the country. You know we we need to talk about yes. in the city, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So so you, you got all these beautiful uh, examples there yeah. that, uh, that 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 tell us about our you know our uh, the way our species has been uh, interacting with the other species pretty much you know yeah. without any and then that's what we got you know. And into uh, multiculturalisms and all that until the shifting of the paradigms a little bit over the past 20 years, right? The, the, the ontological turn, right? When uh, <coughs> we we start thinking about or questioning that divide, right? Between we and nature. Yes. So, so I think that, uh, uh, and then we get back to the story of, of, of explorers. Talking about and the main, you know, the emblematic explorers, you know, like uh, uh, Charles Maria de la Condamine, you know, great geographer going to the Amazon and saying, well, basically, uh, those people are, are stupid. They, right. they, uh, they are like children right. and uh, they have no way of conceptualizing, you know, grandeur or heroism or any of those concepts. And so, so they, uh, they are they're really preparing the way, you know, for all the other great stories, uh, explorers to go to those places and say, hey, we need to take those places. And we end up with the monocrop uh, economic right. narratives of the yeah. of, of nowadays, right? So uh, so so it's, it's very it's really uh, interesting to see how if you go and, and see all the guardians of the forest, you know, traditional cultures yes. and guardians of, of, of the rivers, and I think totally different, being symbolic narratives, right. symbolic narratives of what? Yeah. Symbolic narratives of a way a bioregion, an entire bioregion behaves, yeah. right? In yeah. those narratives, there are myriad, thousands of narratives, you know, you got, a, you got a, a, the guardian of the forest, 
and that uh, <clears throat> if you uh, misbehave, and those are the stories that are that are told through, you know, the past twelve hundred, uh, you know, thousand, uh, I mean, uh, twelve thousand years in, in Amazonia to children uh, about uh, that if, uh, if you overhand, if you overfish, uh, if, you know, the Yakumama or the forest, the Kurpira forest garden is gonna is gonna punish you, yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, those peasants say. Uh, you know, my arm is, it's, it's, it, I, I hurt and I can't work anymore. And then, you know, he's taken to a, he's to be taken to a shaman who is going to tell him, hey, the Purpira punish you because you have been cutting too many trees. And I have been there. I have been there and I have taken him, you know, to, uh, to, to my friend, the doctor in the city. And my friend, the doctor mm -hmm. in the city, the medical doctor, who understands. Uh, the rationality. So, so he said, "Well, uh, yeah, that is true. That is true. And what the shaman gave you, and what he told you, is true. But also, I can help by you taking these Western medicines, and between the two of us, your arm is going to be well again. You know, it's my compadre Pedro, you know, <laughs> telling me that that happened, and I, I took him. But, but this is." A, Many, many, many stories like that. Yeah. You know, fisherman and all that throughout many years uh, of, of hanging out there that I, that I uh, understood this. Yeah. So, so it, it really, uh, your, your storytelling really fits uh, you yeah. know, with those counter narratives yes. because, because people don't get, uh, <laughs> you know, the, if you cut the trees, you know, the water levels are going to come down, yeah, yeah, right? right. Uh, Soil erosion, all yeah, that. Exactly, and uh, so, so, so you get you get it back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very so, good. Well, thank you so much for telling us about these common narratives. So it sounds wonderful, and I I totally agree. It's one of the narrative resources, and I think the you know, one recent interest in eco criticism is to to uncover these uh, narratives. Some of you may have read the re recent, recently published Amitabh Ghosh book, The Nutmeg's Curse, where he also very much uh, connects colo you know, European colonialism with resource extraction and, and, and the, the silencing of these counter narratives. And, and, and I think that absolutely uh, colonial, uh, European colonialism is, is important, though it didn't start with that. That would be my only addition uh, because it starts much earlier and it involves other urban civilizations, including Mesopotamia, including Mayan uh, sort of urban civilization. So it's not just um, a European colonialism versus indigenous. Yeah. It's, it's, I think, really urban civilization versus yeah. non-urban. So the Eastern Island, uh, yeah, exactly. So anyway, so thank you very much. Um, we do have a, a question that came up in the chat. And I just want to ask Robin Goodman if, if you'd like to unmute yourself. We'll try it this way. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, really uh, good to hear that. And also thank you for all your work because, oh my God, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> anthology of world literature and so the question is related to that like when you were doing the anthology you had to have a definition of literature in order to know what you were selecting and what you weren't and from your narrative I got a little bit confused with the contradiction because it seemed it did seem like you were basing your definition of literature on technological advances and that would go against the later part of your narrative where you were saying that Literature, literature can teach us against climate change when climate change is so connected to, to mm -hmm. technological advancement. So how would you connect those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a really great question. And I, I do have a little chapter in that, in that book, uh, Literature for Changing Planet Time, where I talk about that because you're so right. Uh, it, and for me, actually, the, the focusing on different technologies and especially even, even more writing materials is actually the most concrete way in which you can talk about the complicity 
of literature with resource extraction. You know, I start with Mesopotamian cuneiforms, the clay tablets. That's the material out of which Mesopotamian cities are built. They are clay cities. The, 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 the Gilgamesh, the, the, the city wall that Gilgamesh built is made out of clay bricks. The, in fact, the epic of Gilgamesh starts basically by giving you a tour of the city and describing this kind of miracle made out of clay. They even talk about the clay pits in the city of Ur from which this material is harvested. And then of course it becomes the material on which cuneiform writing, which is three-dimensional with incisions onto moist clay is done. All the way to paper, which is of course made from now wood. Uh, um, and in, in, it's an interesting material history of, of paper. It starts with uh, uh, the mulberry tree in China, then in the Arabic world, which I mentioned, the big innovation is that paper uh, can be made out of rags, which is really important. And that becomes, you know, you see images of rag pickers, you know, up until the 19th century. Now, of course, it's made out of uh, pulp wood. So again, a very concrete uh, uh, material base. So I would say this, in the, the sort of this emphasis on technology is, is one way of showing the, the really the complicity of, of literature. And, and I think maybe you could say, maybe that is a deep, the deep way why literature takes the, why the epic of Gilgamesh takes the side of the clay-based civilization uh, uh, of, of, of Uruk against the wilderness. Why a literature defines itself against the wilderness because it, you know, it's made out of pulped trees, literally. So there, there is, I think, actually a very profound aspect to this story. So part of my protocol, and it's time to talk about this right now, but part of the protocol of how to read world literature with or literature with an eye for climate change actually includes thinking about the material base of the different writing technologies from, from, from clay to to mul the mulberry tree, to, to pop the papyrus plant, uh, 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 and, you know, of course, uh, sheepskins, uh, uh, vellum, uh, and, and, and all the way to, to the, the carbon footprint of, uh, you know, electronic storage. Yeah, so really, really a great point. So should I call on Yeah, people? that's fine, yeah. So it's, it's literature kind of, uh, say another media of yeah. climate change, destruction, and is there any way to yeah. change things? I, it, it, to... No. Oh, and I, so I'll actually, I realized I forgot about the definition of literature and that actually connects to your question. Let me first go for a second back because I just realized I only uh, answered the second question. The definition of literature including the anthology was a really interesting and really tricky problem because I would describe the problem like this that our definition of literature as sort of fictional writing of a certain kind of level, sort of elevated fictional writing, is a very, it's basically a post-romantic definition of literature. So we were faced with an interesting dilemma. Either take that, our definition of literature, you know, when you go into a bookstore and what's under literature, to take, to take that and project it back to you know, 4,000 years ago, that didn't seem right. So we basically decided, and that was really our decision, it's also the tradition of teaching these world literature courses, but I think with good reasons, is that this whole you know, definition of even fiction as a, as a, as a term is, 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 is relatively, uh, relatively recent. So we decided that we needed to, to basically use a much more expanded definition of literature that included what we would now describe as philosophical texts. You mentioned Plato. Um, and I love, by the way, the one dialogue, the favorites when Plato leaves the city and walks around in the countryside, but it's like, ooh, where are we here? You know, let's get back to the city. But very much a city person. Um, um, to, now I lost my train of thought because of Plato. Uh, uh, um, so the they expanded it to philosophical writing, of course, religious writing. Uh, you know, I mentioned the, the, the Hebrew Bible, you know, a religious text 
religious storytelling to political texts like you know let's say the declaration of independence or the communist manifesto especially so essentially influential important storytelling in written form so you know just the pure legal text would probably not fall into that definition or you know a treatise on mathematics would probably not fall in this tradition but these other forms of storytelling that we would now call religious or political texts or or, or epics or non-fiction non-fiction texts i think need to be part but it, it's super expansive and you know it, i think for the purposes of this these kind of broad uh, uh, histories important but at the same time along i mean what we did in the anthology is actually also built in little sort of sections on the changing definition, if you will, of literature. So to show that what, what we now call literature is, it, you know, is product of our division of the, 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 the different forms of writing. And, and that, it, you know, if you just go a few hundred years uh, uh, back, it, you're in a very different uh, um, uh, world. So to come, Diego, to come to your uh, uh, question. Yeah, so it's, you know, so the, the question essentially is, so we have, complicity on several levels, on the material level, if you will, and often on the storytelling, call it ideological, if you want, level. So what, what do we do with that? And so my, and I feel this about other forms of complicity too. I feel like that's, it's important to understand it, to diagnose it, but it, I, I don't think it means that you can't use it. So I don't think we, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I feel like that our cultural moment, there is a kind of yearning for purity uh, uh, and complicity is, is a very bad word. And what gets called complicit very quickly then becomes sort of off limits and unusable, spoiled, uh, unredeemable, if, if you will. And I, I don't believe, I think fundamentally, I mean, that's sort of a, I suppose, a kind of philosophical commitment or just life experience. I don't believe in that kind of purism or sometimes I'm almost tempted to call it puritanism uh, um, especially in my neck of the woods in New England so I think that it's okay to use tainted you know tainted materials uh, to refurbish them to use them to to reveal the, the complicity and to try to work with that I think that would be my answer. It's a very abstract answer, I know, but so it's it's uh, complicity doesn't mean okay now we have to you know throw it all away or now we it becomes unus unusable. If that makes sense. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of harmful technologies from the environment that now we can use. Exactly. To exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yes, there's someone you've, you've been very patient. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, and the Buddhists have expanded uh, the definition of literature Latin of the modern day perception because uh, the whole world are in different geographic situations, right? So, for example, East Asia cultures are very uh, sensitive to different seasons, changes, and they take in a lot of literature works. And uh, that's Asian type situation. But now, since we are in a globalization uh, state, do you think the perception of uh, people from different different countries could um, be more aware of some uh, some experience in Asian times they just sink into some countries? Yeah, interesting question. So first of all, this your point about the seasons. It's very interesting, and by the way, that's another one that, that it's very interesting to think about the way different, I mean, both in East Asian literatures, but also in, in other literatures, how the seasons and the rhythms, the change of seasons are presented. There's a, a, a junior scholar in my department, Sarah Dimmick, for example, who has been reading uh, Thoreau's Wall, rereading Thoreau's Walden with a close attention because he chronicles the changes of the seasons. And you realize that it's already different. The seasons in New England have already changed. So it's it's it, you can actually leave, that's one of the interesting ways in which you can use attention to seasons, uh, you know, to get as a record 
of human activity, and but also as a way in which humans think about nature, you're absolutely right. So I think this attention to, to season and changes in season uh, is itself a really great uh, um, focus of attention for, for climate change. But your question really is about globalization and I think how uh, you know, the benefits, I suppose, of literary global, globalization. And um, I, I agree, I mean, no, I, I, I pro it. Uh, <laughs> and I also understand the, you know, the, the, the worries people have about that are certain kinds of storytelling dominating and they're kind of a, a, a crowding out other forms of storytelling. I think that's a serious question. Uh, um, but um, yeah, this, this kind of comparison, put it maybe even simpler, climate change is a global, I mean, it's a very local problem, but it's also a global problem. So it seems therefore to me, in some sense, I mean, this is maybe arguing by analogy, but uh, clear that also in literature, we need a global perspective and also a large scale perspective to, to get a handle on. Yeah, after asking how Black American in literature was also the, um, I mean, actually globalization avoids uh, dominate, domination in literature area because uh, in ancient times, uh, people in different country cultures uh, just allow certain experience into your consciousness, but yes. others are shaped and sink down into your subconsciousness. But now we could read uh, at foreign countries works and aware that oh this experience yeah. is allowed to yes. be conscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. That's a good argument. I, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'll, I'll use that <laughs> because they, you know, did all literature, all literary forms and and genres and traditions act as filters, and certain things are represented and not others. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, so thank you for your talk, by the way. Uh, I, I read a book recently, and this is in the realm of science fiction. And going to the other end of things, talking about what would happen if we started effecting these sorts of changes, like uh, tackling this climate change issue and surrounding how we express it in literature. Even though climate change is a global issue, it would, when we start trying to tackle this issue, it would affect different areas in different ways. And so how would you how would you recommend going about uniting the globe around yeah. an issue that manifests in different ways yeah. through literature? Was, was that the you would know Stevens here, right? Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> <very> fascinating. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know that? So, you know, cyberpunk techno writer, a really interesting book, provocative about geoengineering. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting book about geoengineering. And I think. You know, Stevenson would tend to be sort of pro. It presents itself also very much anti, and it's very polemical in that way, mm -hmm. anti the tree hugging sort of greens. And now we you know, have a billionaire, uh, you know, kind of Elon Musk figure mm -hmm. who's going to just start geoengineering and the enormous geopolitical fallout of that. So it, it's actually, it's the, the kind of positioning against the tree hugging. Is, Annoying, you just have to get over that. But it's really, it's a really interesting, I think, take on the the dangers or you know the knock-on effects of geoengineering. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's it. You're so right, and it's 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 going to be so hard. Um, and the, I mean, there, I suppose, two ways of looking at it. On the one hand, um, you could draw the conclusion that it needs. You know that that we we need to assert the the local and especially the you know the global south and parts of the world that are uh, represented in the power play of politics. Um, and it's interesting in the Neil Stevenson uh, novel. Of course, the, the, the you know the billionaires do it on behalf of some of these, but they're they're very diff, you know it leads to a drought in in India, but it saves you know the <coughs> island state of X from uh, you know climate change. So no, it's it's very so you know the primacy of the local and and I suppose what is often called climate justice goes into that, um, and I think that there's 
right now at our moment very much an intersection of climate literature and climate justice that seeks to pay attention to that in, in a certain way. But I also think that the that talking about in a sense telling a story about this, our species uh, um, um, it, someone mentioned earlier, I think is important because in the end, I think it is a species story. And I think that's why I'm also going so far back. It's not just a story about industrialization. It's not just a story about colonialism. These two are huge, you know, super important, but it's not just about that. Um, and so I think that, and this is, but then, you know, who's gonna tell these stories? This is why I think we need collective acts of storytelling. That, that are differentiated and different, but yet in some, I mean, that's sort of the fantasy frame. This is why I start to think about the frame tell narrative in some way, but I don't really, I can't tell you who's gonna do it and how they're gonna do it, but it seems somehow necessary to me. But so yeah, thanks for bringing Neil Stevenson into the conversation. Yes. Um, oh, good. I just want to say I found the talk very interesting. Um, I think and um, very informative. Love to thank you. Um, I wanted to say that the beginning, particularly, I'm an undergraduate student, but I'm studying Latin American history and um, mythology and linguistics. Um, and I think something that I've been exploring now more because I'm working at this degree and I'm looking. Um, towards the direction of grad school now, um, is for the past about three and a half years, I've been just, you know, tied my very focused on just Latin American history, just mythology, um, learning about ways of integration, learning about um, different art forms and mythologies. Um, and I think something recently that I've been trying to do now is read more historical fiction um, from other places that are not specifically attached to us. And I think when in the beginning you said that you specialized and had um, an area of focus within, I think you said 19th and 20th century, mm -hmm. um, European literature. And then once you got this position, you expanded your knowledge on world literature. I think it's very powerful to look at narratives that aren't so attached to your area of specialization because you're able to see and deconstruct, um, you know, what are um, these ways of life that intersected with, with the area of your study. Mm -hmm. um, it can unravel the myth of progress um, and Western imperialism that is very common amongst mm -hmm. academic, many academic spaces. Um, and you can view um, these cultures that have interacted with your area of study with a more um, so mm -hmm. I, I think that mm -hmm. your beginning really right. spoke to me. And uh, yeah, I've been trying to read more um, Nigerian and more Dominican and yeah. more um, like European historical fiction yeah. because the author sometimes even just gives it away while they're explaining their own culture, mm -hmm. um, how they view themselves and mm -hmm. how they see the world through them. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, the yeah. Myth yeah. and yeah. historical fiction and works of literature like that are really useful um, ways of studying uh, humanity. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's so well put. That's great. Clearly, you're destined for graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing, but it seems like a necessary thing. Um, so that's wonderful. And, you know, it, it's, uh, I agree, you know, I'm a believer in this kind of comparative work. I mean, I think you just gave a, a you know, manifesto for comparative literature. I just want to take this occasion. This is not what you I don't need to say that you're conscious, but to say that I'm not against specializing. You know, specialization is important. But I do think that a discipline, I was just so struck that other disciplines, including very adjacent disciplines like history, for example, but of course, if you go to the sciences, it's the same. Um, that they work at very different scales, you know, microscopic and macroscopic. Um, and it, I just was well, suddenly struck if you think about these disciplinary behaviors and range that we don't, we've sort of lost that, or maybe we've never had it. And there, you know, there are many good reasons, or, 
you know, I fully understand. Uh, but uh, so I just think it, it would be good for the discipline to have sort of both models, the zoom in and, and the zoom out. Um, and for the zoom out, of course, you need specialists more than more than ever. What, what you need in addition to that, though, is a kind of willingness with all the risks involved to do a kind of synthesizing work. Um, and so I think that's uh, uh, it, it's something that I felt was missing from my uh, education. Um, and so I don't really know how that's what you're trying to supply. So anyway, thanks for your comments. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. It's very, very thought provoking. Uh, very thought provoking talk. I, I, I actually sort of ran through two or three questions that had come up, and I won't be brief. I'll just stick with one. Um, and that's uh, one one thing we haven't talked about much this evening is class. Mm -hmm. So class kind of came in the back door through Tommy's manifesto uh, in the discussion of a collective mm -hmm. hero. Uh, and you have to, we have to remember this collective hero is excluded. Hero in particular, yes, it's a small And I, I read something very interesting on social media. I, I, don't, I have no idea who posted it. I'm, I'm a little bit addicted to it at the moment. Um, but it's made reference to the COVID um, pandemic as a kind of preview of what the climate crisis mm -hmm. is going to look like in terms mm -hmm. of class. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure this argument has been made in, in many yes. ways, but I've actually encountered it on, on yes. Twitter. So the the, uh, the the tweeter or the Twitter or whoever whatever you call them uh, pointed out that um, what we see is the upper class the bourgeoisie comfortably sitting in their apartments ordering DoorDash yes. while uh, yes. these uh, these uh, uh, gig economy workers yeah. are essentially forced out yeah. into dangerous uh, uh, situations yeah. to come and then deliver yeah. us our food or whatever it is that we yeah. ordered in order that we don't have to experience the effects of the pandemic. And the, the, the climate crisis, once it's really, I mean, obviously it's really here, but once, mm. once um, it gets to the point that um, uh, it, it, it resembles the, the COVID pandemic, well, we're going to see this, that it's at yeah. a mass level. We're yeah. going to have our, our precarious yeah. economy workers who are out in the heat yes. uh, and all sorts of dangerous, um, in, in, the, in the wet, whatever it is, uh, allowing us, you know, the privileged group, to enjoy our pre-climate um, yeah. change lifestyle yeah. as we were continuing to sort of uh, engage in fantasy of what is happening. Uh, keeping that in mind, I guess I'm just wondering, and, and maybe the problem is, is that my definition of literature is a bit too narrow, and perhaps it's certainly not even, I guess, what I was thinking of when I came into this group, as literature is not nearly as expansive as the definition that you just, just suggested. But I, I still kind of can't help but thinking that maybe we're barking up the wrong tree by talking about literature. Mm. Um, that is to say that, that we, we need to find forms of storytelling yes. that, that, it's, that, that will appeal yes. to other groups. And, and perhaps, it, and, and obviously, I mean, there, there are different ways to think about this, right? The list that you came up with about stories, the kinds of plots, the sort of stories that they want to use to tell yes. narratives yes. Of, of, of nature, of yes. climate, of change. Um, you would seen, I, I kind of got a whiff, and maybe you actually articulated this, a kind of managerial whiff, right? We're the specialists, we need to, we need to um, yes. uh, suggest that these yes. are the kinds of narrative that yeah, will be yeah. effective. We recommend, um, highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, precisely. And again, I, I, nothing, I, I have nothing, nothing personal. No, 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 no. I, 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 I sort of got a whiff of Harvard here. That's sort of yes. a very sociological, very yes. kind of um, top down. Yes. Um, yes. uh, approach to these problems. And again, yes. I'm not, not criticizing, I'm sort of trying no, to no, 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 no. <laughs> is, is literature sufficient? Yes. We can think about other forms yes. um, on the yes. one hand. And then is it even for us to, uh, to try to determine this? Yes. Uh, a specialist, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, we, yes. other, we put ourselves with this uh, priest yeah. who are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, very, I, I, take, I take that. Uh, really, thank you for that. For, for the first, with COVID, I mean, I think I agree with this very depressing diagnosis. I would just add, it, the, it's not just that COVID is a kind of dress rehearsal. COVID is part of the history of climate change because it's, you know, it's, it's about expanding human habitations into the wilderness. This is how, I mean, the whole history of urbanism is a history of endemic diseases, always jump, jumping from either domesticated animals 
or wild animals. So it is about habitats and you know the wildling coming into the you know wilderness. That that's how it happens. So COVID really is one small part of climate change. It's it's actually not separate from it. Um, but yes, the managerial. Uh, so okay. Uh, uh, so first of all, about literature and storytelling, I completely agree. So I think in the first part about how to read literature. I use literature because that's the, the object and, and you know, with the technology as a kind of diagnosis. But in the second part, I really talk about stories for exactly the reason that you give. And obviously these story types and so on and so forth are, you know, I mentioned Hollywood and other forms of storytelling. And of course, you know, the, the collective acts of storytelling, the, 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 the social media that you seem to be a, a, a you know, more of an expert and then you admit in your own, you know, I don't even know what, what we call that. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, it's maybe part of that. Uh, uh, um, so totally right. And so the, your last point about the, the expert uh, culture, uh, I, I, I take that, I think you're right. And I have to think a little more about it. What the, 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 the reason why I emphasize that, I think is to, encourage, okay, let me put it this way. I feel that there are certain habits that a lot of humanity scholars cultivate and attitudes, including be study the, you know, the, the not useful, the non-instrumentalized kind of, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are not like the engineers and the gear engineers, we are, you know, describing the free play of the mind and other facts. Exactly. And so I think that, uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a big hesitation to do anything that smacks of utility or instrumentalizing literature or anything like that. And that's what I'm mostly against. I think we need to instrumentalize. For example, I think we need to learn much more. So, you know, when I speak to other climate scientists and I part of these, they turn to us, they understand this thing about storytelling. They say, so uh, you, you're literature scholars, which story types actually work? What do you know about genres and their effects on readers? And I realized actually, I have no idea. This is all guesswork. I mean, I have my favorite genre. Someone else has their favorite genre. So I actually think we need more empirical knowledge about literature and genres. And I, I think we, we need to instrumentalize in some sense. So it's less that I trust in the expert, you know, literature scholars. I, I, wanna, I want literature scholars to in, instrumentalize their knowledge because not a kind of managerial form, but I do think that there is a narrowness to this kind of defaulting to certain stories. And I do think that when I think about what role can literary scholars play in helping to solve the climate crisis, that is the role. Knowing about literature, knowing more about different genres, understanding options, understanding you know, about collective protagonists, rethinking options and offering a, a toolbox, as I mentioned. And so, so it's, a, it's really kind of a sub, quite subservient role, if you will, or a sort of an auxiliary, an auxiliary role that I imagine not a kind of all-knowing top-down thing. But I think the conditions for that is a change in how humanists think about instrumentalization and utility. But the same token, one hopes that these narratives can come from the excluded. Also, so they, I think they come, and, and this, this goes back, I think, to the first question about indigenous storytelling, absolutely, but not only. I think there's also in, among eco-critics who are interested in indigenous storytelling, there is sometimes a, I think, naive belief that that will solve all of our problems. And that's where I actually find someone like Neil Stevenson, an interesting counter narrative. I don't believe that, uh, actually. I think it's important to, to, to cast the net very wide and also understand absolutely that there's knowledge in indigenous oral storytelling. And it's true that all cultures, all writing cultures have always looked down on 
oral storytelling traditions. It's built in, and if we need to go against it, it's very important. But I, I don't think that uh, this idea, which I may be here implicit in what you say, that the solution is only going to come from the excluded or from below, I, I guess I don't fully believe. Well, I, I, I'm myself wondering if maybe we can't do without priests, but also. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I want to let Professor Crooker off the hook say thank you so no, much for being so generous with your time, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>